I've been probably no sleep for a while now. Some of the first-hand accounts I see on here help me with my work. However, other times I can't help but think, how the hell are you still alive? But then it makes me realize that for every account that I read of somebody surviving, there are actually three more cases where somebody did die because of their stupid mistakes. So I'm here to try to keep you all from being mauled, abducted, eaten, or otherwise messed up by the things that go bump in the night. Most likely you're thinking, what gives this guy the right to talk down to us like he is? Well, I've been hunting these things for 29 years now. Most people in my line of work don't make it to 10, much less 30. Before you ask, no, I will not be having a party. My point is that I know a hell of a lot about these things. You need to learn to stay alive if you have my job. It's not as easy as reading the old stories. And that leads into the first thing that I would like to address. Lore. I have an acronym for lore. Lost over recent eras. And this little beauty has saved my life plenty of times. Do not expect to survive an encounter with a creature that you know nothing about. And do not expect to survive an encounter with a creature using 400 year old information. And not only is lore old information, but it's basically a giant game of telephone spanning centuries. If you millennials even know what a telephone is. It's word of mouth and it's not to be trusted. For example, there's a myriad of differences between the European lycanthrope and the North American skinwalker. An important difference to know is that lycanthropes have no power over their transformation, while skinwalkers can transform at will when they've mastered the technique. When confronting a lycanthrope, they expect it to act like a rabid beast. They are predictable, however, in the sense that they will attack pretty much anything. Lycanthropes are often 8 to 10 feet tall, and depending on the height of the individual prior to transformation. They are heavily built and are extremely strong. Lycanthropy is a disease, and the movie's got that one right. Europe is full of these transformative viruses. They contort the base genome of DNA. Ever heard of the Black Death? It's the same type of disease and just a different transformative effect. And because the disease changes the infected person's DNA, it can be passed down through family lines. Skinwalkers, however, do not transform because of a disease. They use blood magic. I hate blood magic so much. Native American lore talks of shaman who dabbled in the dark arts, shape-shifting mainly. The shaman would wear the pelts of an animal of their choosing, and then shift into their form. Well, the lore is not entirely accurate, as usual. Skinwalkers cannot shift into animals. They blend with them. They are humanoid beastmen. Most commonly, they use a canid as their animal. Why? Because it's blood magic. For the spell to work, the shaman or the idiot playing with forces they don't understand, must skin the animal they want to shift into alive. Capturing and skinning a coyote or a fox is far easier than skinning a bear, a deer, or other creatures of the forest. So guess what every dumbass thinks? That's a werewolf. Look honey, it's a werewolf. No it isn't. Let me make some things perfectly clear. Skinwalkers can still maintain their human intelligence after transformation. They are still able to reason. That means opening doors, ambushing prey with bait, evading being filmed and captured, etc. I know firsthand how dangerous a case of a mistaken identity can be for an experienced hunter. I can't even begin to tell of the danger that a novice hunter is in. I was working with a man named Lincoln. A hunter of 8 years. I was only 12 years into my career at the time. We had gotten a tip from a local shaman on an Indian reservation that something was wrong. He whispered of animals slaughtered and howls in the night. Now I knew what he meant immediately. 
skinwalker. Nothing that I hadn't seen before. My partner, on the other hand, had never heard of a skinwalker, so I had to give him a crash course. All the basics. Don't use silver. Find some monk's hood, more commonly known as wolfsbane, and poison your crossbow. And treat it like an intelligent human being. Well, Lincoln apparently took my advice to the letter. He walked up to me a half an hour later with a wolfsbane plant. He tore it from the ground, root and stem, without any gloves. For those who do not know, monkshood is very poisonous, sometimes lethal. And now at least he hadn't eaten any. He had the common sense not to ingest a toxin, strong enough to knock a freaking beastman on their ass. But still, he was in danger of being affected by the plant. I told Lincoln that he had to sit this one out. Through skin contact, monkshood toxin can cause heart palpitations, sweating, and disorientation. Any of these symptoms mean that Lincoln would be easy prey for any skinwalker prowling around. He was furious. We had agreed to work together and split the reward for the wolves. But because of his stupid mistake, he had forfeited that reward. That night, I went into the woods alone. Or at least I thought I did. I set up shop in a tree stand, and I set up camouflage and I masked my scent with piss. The skinwalker's piss to be exact. I was deep in his territory and his scent was everywhere. I don't know if you've ever smelled skinwalker piss, but it is rank. Think bleach, mixed with wet dog and the smell of dirty water. The reason that the smell is so strong is because the body expels toxins ingested to cause the shift. You are royally messing up your body when you skin shift, and it's no joke. Most men break under the stress of the transformation. They go feral, and when the change is over, they are whimpering babies unable to reason or speak. It's for this reason that most of the time, my job is over before it even begins. But sometimes a man is strong enough to survive the change. When a man becomes a beast and is still able to reason like a human, and that is when skinwalkers are at their most dangerous. While well, I tracked it down to its lair, it saved space to endure the change. I set up the stand there and I waited. Hours had passed and, eventually, I saw a bipedal creature. It seemed unsteady and exhausted. I took a long look through my crossbow scope, outfitted with night vision, and I swore. It was Lincoln. That idiot had tracked me right to his house, and the moron was knocking at his door. To his credit, he almost did everything right. He even brought the monk's hood. Unfortunately, unless it's distilled, it would give off an odor that a skinwalker could smell from a mile away. Now I knew that Lincoln was dead. The skinwalker would have already caught the scent of the plant. No way in hell he was getting out of this. And since the activity was going on for some time, I had to assume that the skinwalker survived the initial shift. Once he chowed down on one hunter, he would be on edge for more. So I did the only thing I could do to stay alive. I shot that prick Lincoln in the back with a wolfsbane lace crossbow bolt. It was a clean shot. It brought him down, and it struck an artery that I would expect. His already increased heart rate from the effects of the poison would be through the roof, spreading the toxin around. He screamed in blood and then he screamed some more. And that only got the asshole more stirred up. Soon I could hear crashing through the undergrowth. The skinwalker had come to pay his respects to Lincoln. If he was screaming before, he was really screaming now. That beast had its snout in his chest before he could blink. Hell, before I could blink. When you first see one of these things, it's revolting. But as time goes on, you start to see them for the magnificent predators that they are. As I was sitting there, watching the skinwalker feed on Lincoln, it was an almost cathartic thing. So I waited some more after he was done and it started shitting. And I mean really shitting. Leaving trails of it everywhere. And urinating too. 
It tried to run, but it couldn't. The poison was already taking hold. I think halfway through the great beast shitting out chunks of Lincoln and blood, it realized that it was dying. It snarled and looked around, howling into the night sky. And then it saw me drop out of my tree stand. I walked over to the skinwalker and I met its gaze with my own. With its eyes it told me everything that I needed to know. How they looked me over and bore into mine. It knew that I was the one who had outsmarted it, and it hated me for it. I put a bolt between its eyes and I burned the body, Lincoln's tour and what was left of it. My family has been hunting these things for generations and if there's one thing I've learned in almost 30 years of hunting, it's that to kill a monster, sometimes you have to become one. Now some of you might find my methods a little extreme. You'll be happy to know that my wife and kids are a little less brutal, and that's what I would use. My son Ian is in Ireland studying the Fae. My daughter Lizzie is in Europe hunting the real monsters, lycanthropes, vampires, and the like. My wife Samantha is in Asia hunting all manner of monsters. I can't even pronounce most of them, but she could. My brother is in Australia hunting God knows what. I have emailed them the information to this Reddit account. If you have any particular questions, please comment. We all have our share of messed up stories, so we can entertain you, educate you, and make our jobs easier at the same time. I'll update this tomorrow. Oh, and do us all the favor and don't go messing with anything you don't understand. You don't want to end up like Lincoln did. Hey everybody, I'm back. I'm going to be doing one more post and then I'm handing the reins over to my son, Ian. My wife is currently investigating suspicious reports of activity in India, which means she can't be here to write about her experiences right now. So I guess you're all stuck with me again. Aren't you lucky? As I read through some of the comments, I was surprised how knowledgeable some of the people were about things that go bump in the night. I'm almost proud to say that most of the people who have commented appear to have enough brain cells not to be a Lincoln. Touching on that story, I mentioned yet another encounter with a skinwalker, where I should have ended up like Lincoln. But it, wait no, he, showed me mercy. It was my fifth year hunting, I thought I was already a master hunter at that point. I thought I had seen everything, and been exposed to enough shit not to be phased until I met my first skinwalker. I was trained in Europe by my grandmother, the most badass granny that you'll ever meet, and now she was a master. Almost 50 years of hunting and it was cancer that took her, arguably one of the worst monsters that she ever faced. And now grandmother was used to a more superstitious time. Nowadays we love our monster media, the top 10 list than monster movies. We freaking love it. Of course, misrepresentation of monsters in media is also a dangerous thing. Do you know how many teenage girls went missing after the Twilight movies were released? Way too many. Let's get one thing straight. Werewolves are not cuddly and vampires do not glitter. I'm sorry, getting off topic. My point is that I thought I was tough shit. After conquering Europe, I went back home, back to Virginia. I thought after my training that I'd be ready for whatever unholy pricks were stalking the Americas. So I took a case. A Vietnam vet claiming to have seen big wolves in the woods surrounding his farm. I thought, okay, a pack of werewolves. Simple. Pack the silver and get ready for a hell of a hunt. But then he started talking about it more. And the more he explained what was happening, the more anxious, yes anxious I started to get. Barn doors were open without force, and the cattle were being slaughtered. It just lifted the latch and it opened the doors. Every lycanthrope I've come across in the Americas and Europe have not been able to open doors. I've seen them recognize a gun and flee. On the rare occasion, a lycan is smart enough to avoid the traps. But open doors? That's a different story. 
He discussed his fear that he was being tormented by teenagers in the area, but I put his fears to bed. No group of drunk kids would have killed his cattle. I left his house and I entered his barn. He hadn't cleaned it up and the stench of decay was overpowering. But underneath it all, I could smell something even more rank. A wet dog and bleach. A scent that I would eventually grow to love. There wasn't much blood within the barn, but the stalls were a different story. The cattle had been slaughtered all in the same way. Their necks were broken and their bodies slid open after the fact. I knelt down to examine the corpse of one of the cows, and I looked for any missing organs. Lichens love stomachs and fatty meat from the lower abdomen, but in this case, the heart was missing, and the rib cage was barely damaged. It was a systematic slaughter, each of the cows the same. Neck broken, body opened, heart removed. Clearly the Virginia countryside had some surprises for me. That day when I went into the woods, I knew that I would be meeting something that I had never seen before. And I knew that it would be one messed up monster. I set up camp deep in the forest, in a clearing and I settled down to wait. When the sun started to set, I positioned hanging lanterns from the trees around me and I built a large fire in the center. I placed a slab of beef within my sleeping bag next to the fire and I settled down in a high tree branch. Soon night fell and the only place that wasn't pitch black was the clearing that I was lounging over. Honestly, this was a recon mission. I just wanted to see what would happen. I was not disappointed. A large dark furred creature jumped in from the tree line to the center of the clearing and almost gracefully ripped the beef out of the bag and had flung it away into the trees. It was canine, that much I was certain of. It whirled to stare directly at the branch I was perched upon. The eyes glinted green in the light of the fire, and the snot moved and it twitched. I could see the creature in startling detail and it was not pretty. Upon the back it was covered in fur, and it thickened upon the head and its shoulders. The lower you got down the body, the less hair you would find. But still, its eyes seemed to be mine. Now I'll be honest, this is the tried and true method for hunting lichens. Set up a trap and wait for it to spring. However, it was not the tried and true method for hunting skinwalkers. It could smell me from a hundred yards away, and this one was intelligent enough to know what humans stank like. But still, I remained steady and calm. It knew that I was there, but I would just take it down. I reached for my crossbow and I hesitated. It hadn't attacked me. It was really ugly, but it didn't climb the tree and rip me down from my branch. If I reached for a weapon, it surely would. This was its encounter now. I was its. I did something stupid. Never do what I did, never. I dropped out of the tree to face a skinwalker on the ground. Immediately, it lowered onto all fours, snarling. I clutched my crossbow and I aimed it at the skinwalker, snarling myself. We locked eyes and held our positions in that firelit clearing for what felt like an age. I had seen what this thing did to the cattle. If it was the same beast, it would have no trouble taking a bolt to the chest and tearing me into two. But while I was squaring off with this thing, I saw that its eyes were not the amber of a lichen or the dead white of a wendigo. They were a gentle green, and it showed an emotion that I knew all too well. Fear. And that's when it clicked. This thing was a person. I dropped my crossbow and I raised my hands in surrender. It kicked it away to my right. The skinwalker slowly rose on two legs and it looked over me. I was practically crapping myself. This was not what my grandmother had taught me. She taught me to kill on sight. Well now, this monster, the thing that had me in its mercy, wasn't killing me on sight. Talk about the irony. Can you understand me? I asked cautiously. 
My only response was a twitch of the ear. The skinwalker suddenly snarled and out of the darkness surrounded the clearing came a blood-curdling shriek. A smaller skinwalker, a tan blur leapt from the trees and attacked the monster, rolling into the fire. Sparks flew and both beasts roared in pain. I rolled to the side and I snatched my crossbow from the grass, trying to understand what was going on. Blood flew and the tan monster tore at its opponent's stomach with its powerful back legs. I realized that this was the beast that had slaughtered the cattle. I took aim with my crossbow and I fired into the heap of monster. It struck the smaller skinwalker and it leapt away hissing. I was horrified. This thing was furious and covered in blood. It seemed to have six small breasts going down the chest, suggesting a female. Only now I know how rare that really is. It was a female skinwalker. He used the skin, I assume, of a lynx to shift. This female was grabbed by the male and shoved headfirst into the fire. As the fur of the beast roasted, I could smell the piss evaporating off of it. I reloaded my crossbow and I took another shot, striking the hind leg of the female. She yowled and the male got behind her, and it sunk its teeth into the back of her neck. She screamed and screamed, and her cries seemed more human the more that I heard them. Eventually there was enough pressure on the neck that with the resounding crunch, the female was still. The male fell backwards, torso and arm torn and bleeding. He looked at me and I looked at him. I guess he assumed that I was going to kill him. I'll admit, after that display, I was really tempted. But I had finished my job. Well, technically the skinwalker had, but still, I didn't have to stay there. I turned and I left the male to lick his wounds. I haven't heard anything else from that area since. Maybe one day he'll find me again and we'll have a nice reunion. Or maybe we'll both try to kill each other. If the years have hardened him like they have me, probably the latter. Hey everyone, it's Ian. Sorry for the late update, spirits have been noisy lately. Although, I'm sure you already know about my talents if my dad still mentions me as often as he does. It's been a while since I've been in the US to visit him. The Fae up here in Ireland keep me plenty busy. That's right, Fae, not fairies. Whoever decided to liken the nasties to fluttering girls in short dresses really had one dreadful sense of humor. I've got the bite marks to prove it. I figure y'all got some sort of knowledge about the subject, but allow me to paint you the full picture. Let's start with where they're from, because they sure as hell, pardon my French, aren't from Neverland, or anywhere on this plane for that matter. If you've ever been to Ireland, then you probably heard of fairy forts. Well, I have news for ya. They aren't forts. They're portals. Or rather, interdimensional rips, and every so often, something nasty pops out of them to steal an infant. That's right, they have their own dimension. But they seem to take great pleasure in wreaking havoc in ours. I've never been, but that's only because I value... Well, pretty much everything about myself and I would like to stay intact. I also wouldn't be writing to you now if I had visited the Fae in their world. You ever seen Alice in Wonderland? Imagine that on acid and more teeth. Or so I've been told. Anyway, these things are twisted. They are only loyal to themselves in their court. Seely or unseely. It doesn't matter which a fae is pledged to, it is likely to have plans to eat you. Speaking of eating, just yesterday I was called by a woman to investigate her ex-husband's death. Apparently, he was a farmer from Tillage who was found dead, after supposedly being mauled by dogs. Funny thing is this, that the night before his corpse was found, all the dogs in the neighborhood howled in unison for hours. If that doesn't scream bar guest, I don't know what does. Through my years in Ireland, seven to be exact, I've seen a lot. And even though I've seen the aftermath of men abducted by the Fae, I still want to make proper contact. Just to sit down and have a conversation. 
with one of the courts and make it out alive. Dad tried to get me to go hunting with Emma. I never really took. I've always been a fellow for diplomacy. My sister is far different, but I don't want to get into her right now. Give me a good buck, a grieving family, and a spirit to set free over camping in the woods, rolling in urine and tracking fecal matter any day. What my dad does is admirable, but you have a different tool for every job. He has an axe, my sister a sledgehammer. I'm a staple. While they're off smashing things, I'm holding families together and binding souls to the resting place. Now, don't get me wrong, I kill monsters just like the rest of my family. But I try to hunt actual monsters, not to misunderstood creatures and lost souls. If you all have some questions about souls, spirits, and the like, drop them in the comments. But I've been sent here to write about monsters, and I'm sure that's what you want to hear about anyway. So let's talk about my scariest experience in Ireland. Ireland is an ancient and powerful place. Like Native American forest spirits, the entities tied to this place are as old as the land itself. Which means they don't take too kindly to visitors. Especially visitors born in a land deeply entrenched by another spiritual energy. For the first three years after my arrival in Ireland, spirits were attracted to me. Now, I had no problem with this. I see spirits and I talk to them. And I help them achieve peace and forgiveness for the way they died. Or for what force ended their brief walk on the mortal plane. But other things in Ireland are attracted to lost souls. Things that are far older and far more dangerous than anything my father has ever faced. The Slua Most lore you read nowadays will explain that the Slua are the lost souls of sinners, banished to wander the world in anguish forever. However, this was only written after the Christian faith became prevalent in Ireland. The truth is, is that the Slua are fey, too extreme for both courts. Now when a group of fey is too extreme for the Seely and Unseely court, that's when you have to be aware that they are nothing to be underestimated. The Slua are able, like most spirits and magical creatures, to change their shape. Most often they appear as a cloud of ravens, or a dark storm cloud overhead. They are always present in Ireland, and they seek lost souls to devour. Someone who goes through life not believing in an afterlife or spirits in general, are easy prey for the Slua. They are anguished to realize that they were wrong about their soul, and it's like a firecracker shot up in the air, spelling dinner in neon sparklers. And the Slua can also kill humans still present on this plane by tearing their soul out through their eyes. It's something not mentioned in the lore, but it's one of the reasons the Slua prefer an avian form. Plucking out eyes and devouring souls, Jolly old Ireland, am I right? It's not all that bad, though. The Slua can only attack a solar human if they are in despair, and their souls are heavy with guilt. The Slua will also attack children, namely infants, a theme you'll find all too often with the creatures of Ireland. St. Patrick may have scared the snakes off of Ireland, but the Fae and the other uglies? He didn't even touch them. The Fae are from a different dimension. This means that holy relics from Iris have no effect upon them. Bogarts, the Slua, Kelpies, Hobgoblins, they are all immune to silver, wolfsbane, and other traditional ways of confronting monsters. Their physiology is so remarkably different from ours, and yet it's so similar that it's a headache to study in detail. The Fae need to eat like us and they prefer meat from us. To the Fae, human flesh is considered a delicacy. Almost universally, once the Fae get a taste of human flesh, they crave it. Like a drug addict craves his next fix. However, while the Fae are magical, they can be killed. In fact, they can be struck down by traditional means. However, the Fae have so many weapons at their disposal, that using a gun without the proper magical or spiritual wards is suicide. Some Fae have mind control or mind influence. The Kelpies are like this. They appear as an attractive man, and lure human women down to the riverside, and then they drag them under and devour them. 
The Fae have a particular fascination with the male and female reproductive organs. The Fae, at least from what I have seen, do not have genitalia. I don't know how they breed or if they even breed at all. I have watched Fae hunters field dress humans and have a detailed description of their techniques. If you want to read it, ask in the comments. The Fae abduct children out of their cradles. I have no idea what they do with them, but I know what they do with the ones who don't meet their needs. I found their bones scattered around fairy forts all over Ireland. Ireland is a place deeply entrenched in its magic, and for hundreds of years it was separated and isolated from other spirits and monsters. As a result, the good Irish folk are among the most horrifying and complex of all entities dwelling, well partially on earth. The only advice I can give to you is to avoid the water and to hide and think happy thoughts when ominous clouds of birds fly towards you. Oh, and cover your eyes. That helps too. Stay safe, everyone. I'm back again. My son is busy and my daughter is writing her post, supposedly. So I'm back with a very recent story from Canada. I was recently messaged by a young man named James. He told me that I had saved his life. When I asked him how he knew I was the man who saved him, he said, You swore as much as you do on here. I can't argue with that. Now this guy and his group of friends were camping in Canada. This is some classic college party type shit. Tents, red solo cups, horny 20-somethings, and a wendigo. Or maybe the wendigo being there is my kind of party instead. Whatever, here we go. Brace yourselves, and if you're squeamish when it comes to gore, please don't read this. The Wendigo are nasty things. I was on my way to Rocky Mountain National Park in Canada. It's relatively close to the U.S. and the Canadian border, so I decided to go check it out. I had heard some reports from Connie, a park ranger and an old friend that some hikers had gone missing. Two men wearing blue parkas went into the park and they never came out. Connie suspected foul play. And I hunt people as well as monsters, so I decided to give her a visit. I went up and I had a drink with her and she told me that she actually suspected far worse. She was in the office when she called, so she couldn't say it out loud, but she believed that it was a wendigo. I think they're nesting. I don't know how long they've been in the park, but the activity has been more recent and more common. Wendigo nest. Just like bees. There are those that stay to watch the hive and those that go pollinate flowers. Only instead of pollinating flowers, they abduct unwary campers. Sometimes the Wendigo do them the mercy of eating them. Sometimes they don't. Either way, the Wendigo wins. Now if they're nesting, then they have a steady food source and a monarch. In northern national parks like this one, Wendigo are actually a more common problem than they are made out to be. Most times, it's one or two and they just kill a deer, elk, or the occasional bear, and they don't come into contact with humans. But there is the odd Wendigo that is more ambitious and they become monarchs. Killing and eating our own kind is a taboo in our culture, but if a Wendigo can do it, it's a sign of strength. Connie had been keeping tabs on the Wendigo population in the park. They weren't under control, but then the summer came. All the activity drove them out, and a total of three groups of campers had gone missing in the past five months. One group of five teenagers, the two hikers, and a family of three were all missing. They were all dead, no question. But I had agreed to go anyway. I told Connie I would be looking for the missing campers, and I would be careful. But I wasn't going to bother. If they were still alive, it wouldn't be for much longer. What I was going to do was find the nest and destroy it as well as kill every last one to go in it. Connie took me deep within the park, to the area she said the missing hikers were and left me to search. As I walked around the deep forest, the sun started to set. But even in the dim light, I could see the telltale signs of Wendigo and habitation, pools of blood and chunks of meat. Wendigo can't digest food, they are eternally hungry. They eat, but they can't process the prey, so they vomit up the remnants. 
Those puddles were the aftermath of a Wendigo having a nice snack. I knelt down to examine the puddle, and I found tufts of fur and a singular yellow eye. It seems the Wendigo ate a wolf. As I kept walking, I heard voices. I crept over to the source of the noise and I peered from between the brush of a campsite. There was a large fire and the scent of weed hung in the air. Around the fire were five kids, two girls, and three guys. They were joking and laughing like nothing was going on, even though they were deep into Wendigo territory. The fire was the only thing keeping them at bay. These must be the five missing 20-somethings, and they weren't missing, not yet. Just stoned out of their goddamn minds and lucky as all hell. Hey, pass the weed. A girl with pink hair called from across the fire. A burly guy with a beard and curly hair tossed her the bag. But the throw came up short and their prize bag landed in the fire. Shit, water guys, save the weed. One yelled. Another girl with piercings glinted in the firelight, poured water on the pit, and it was out. The one thing keeping them safe was gone, all to save some freaking weed. Guess your guardian angel didn't help that time, Andy. Someone said to the guy who threw the weed. He doesn't help with basic shit like that, Andy said. They still had no clue what was about to happen. I ran out of the tree line, lit a flare, and I tossed towards the group. I covered my eyes and I heard a shriek. When I looked back, I could see all five of the kids halted together, and almost upon them, bathed in the red glow of my flare, was a wendigo. It still had the remnants of a parka upon its back. I guess that clears up one of the hikers then. What the hell is that? I heard one of the girls yell. I pulled my pistol from my holster, and I fired three shots into the Wendigo. The bullets burst into flame on impact and the creature began to scream. I plugged two more incendiary rounds into the Wendigo's chest and it fell back, twisting and convulsing. I got closer and I pulled my knife from its holster. The tough hide was already weakened by the fire, and the creatures do best in the cold. I slammed my knife into its heart and every muscle of the monster seemed to tighten, and then it was still. I turned and I faced the kids, and they seemed more scared of me than the bastard I had put down. Holy shit, Andy, I changed my mind, the girl with the pink hair said. I'm not an angel, I'm just a hunter, I said, reloading my pistol. A guy with shoulder-length brown hair looked me up and down. You don't look like a hunter, man. And you messed that thing up like you knew how to do it. You basically have a handheld flamethrower for Christ's sake. He pushed his glasses up on his face. Make a new fire and stay close to it. They won't attack you if you get that fire large enough. I said gruffly. Hold on man, you know a lot about these things right? The tallest amongst the group asked. He towered above them and me. Yeah, but I don't want a group of tagalongs. Especially you five. They all stood together, and they met my eyes. Like it or not, we're coming with you. We're safe with you, Pinky said. I had to chuckle at that one. Safe and my job don't mix, and if I'm not safe, they definitely aren't. Fine, but where I'm going, there's going to be more. To be honest, I didn't take the time to learn their names. James told me them after the fact. I just attributed the first thing that came to mind to each kid. Pinky was Allie, Beardy was Andy, and Glasses was Mike. The tall guy was James, and Piercings was Jess. So there I went. I gave each of them a flare, and I told them to light it when I told them to. I lit mine, and they stayed glued to my ass as I walked through the forest. I followed the pools of blood, visible by the moonlight reflected off of them. Eventually, we stumbled upon a cave entrance, the perfect place for a wendigo nest. I took out my crossbow and I peered down the sights. The cave opened into a massive chamber, dimly lit by the moonlight. We snuck in and we were greeted by the stench of rotting meat. God, that's nasty. Jess whispered behind me. Stay low and stay quiet. 
I whispered fiercely back. As we took cover behind some rocks, I heard crying. I looked over at the far corner of the chamber through my scope and I saw a wendigo holding a man by the shoulders. Another walked up and pried his mouth open. How a human becomes a wendigo is through the consumption of human flesh, corrupted by the wendigo. They feed their human captives remnants of their kills daily. That's like really messed up mother birds. The wendigo clamped its mouth over the man's. Soon all that filled the cabin was the man's gurgling and his family screams. What the hell is happening? James said. The monarch is going to begin the gestation process. I said back. Man, who the hell are you? How are these things getting pregnant? And he hissed, scared. Shut the hell up, Beardy. I said. Beardy? He said back to me. Mike, you have a beard too, so why am I Beardy? He called me glasses earlier, and just go with it, I guess. Mike whispered back. I didn't even bother to tell them to be quiet. I was watching the Wendigo Monarch. Killing the Monarch would send the nest into anarchy. Wendigo that are turned by another Wendigo are linked. This Alpha had turned a total of four people. I had killed one, and there was another holding the man the Monarch was feeding. Which left one... Shit. I whirled around and I pulled my pistol from its holster and my knife from its sheath. We were missing a wendigo and it was coming from outside. Follow me now, I said. What about the people that they captured? Mike said. What about them? Save the lives that you can. We can't help them but I can help you five. Now move it, I said. I led the group back through the tunnel, straight into the Wendigo. It snarled at me and I pointed four times in the chest. I jumped forward and I sucked my knife deep into its heart, through the weakened hide. The Wendigo heard the shot go off, no question. I told them to run out of the cavern. They didn't need to see what I was doing. I reached into my bag and I pulled out a brick of C4. I stuck it into the cave wall and I stepped out, into the open air. Is that C4? Who are you? Jess yelled, throwing her hands up into the air. Not important, I said as I went to blow the charge, trapping the Wendigo inside. Wait, uh, Mike's in there. James called out. My brother isn't out here. I sighed and I ran back into the cavern, my pistol at the ready. Looking into the dim light, I saw the red glow of Mike's flare on the other side of the cavern, trying to free the prisoners. He was waving the flare from side to side, keeping the two Wendigo at bay. He was carrying a child in one arm and a woman was following close behind. Glasses, you dumbass! Get over here! I roared, firing my pistol at the white, sunken figures chasing Mike. A Wendigo managed to slash Mike's ankle and he stumbled, bleeding. He flung the flare behind him. He gave the woman her child and pushed her onward, still limping from the wound in his leg. She ran towards me and out of the cave. Mike was still hobbling on his one good leg when they got him. They grabbed his legs and they pulled him down, claws skinning the flesh below the knees. Mike screamed and his glasses slid off his face to skid across the rough floor. The two Wendigo pulled Mike up and they tore his stomach open and they began eating Mike while he was still alive. His screams turned into a gurgle when they tore into his throat. I turned and I ran from the cave, swearing. As I left, I detonated the charge, crushing the Wendigo. I stopped and I caught my breath. James approached me and I just shook my head. We left that park with one last twenty-something. He stayed to help two strangers and he died, so that they could live. I'm not going to give you a bullshit speech about morals. I'll just tell you now. Mike was a hero. I'm not, but he was. But if being a hero means being eaten alive by a Wendigo, I'll stick to being a piece of shit. And to all the comments thanking me, if you want to thank someone, thank Mike for saving a woman and her child. And thank James for telling me to share his brother's story.
I'm just doing my job. You don't think the garbage man, that's what I am. The supernatural garbage man.